In this Bucharest cemetery lies the cobbler's apprentice who became Romania's fountain of light and giant of the Carpathians. He was a man who once thought his people would worship him forever. <laughs> Today, all that's left of Nicolae Ceausescu is the image of one of the most despised dictators of modern times. Who was Nicolae Ceausescu? Was he really a monster? And did he deserve his horrible end? As a correspondent in 1968, I had witnessed Ceausescu's extraordinary popularity after his defiance of the Soviet Union had made him a hero to his people and in the West. A year after his death, I drove to his hometown. I wanted to look at the myth he had fabricated in his lifetime and find out why things had gone so wrong. With emotion and mindria in the entire country, we will see this image from the city of the Scornicest, the old Vatra Romanian, where, with 60 years ago, in a small town, the son of Alexandrinei and Alexandrinei and of Andruța Ceaușescu, the one who, today, in front of the Communist Party and of the country, expresses in the highest grade the aspirations of the Roman people. Today, we will serve at the anniversary of the birth of the birth, this rebuilt peasant cottage bore little relation to the real thing. The myth starts here at Nikolai Ceausescu's birthplace in Skornicesti. All the reverential biographies of the Ceausescu era portray him in almost caricatural terms as a precocious genius determined from childhood to root out social injustice. From contemporaries, former colleagues and prison companions, speaking freely for the first time, I was to get a very different picture at almost every stage of his life. This was the kind of house young Nikolai really lived in. It still belongs to his neighbor, Floria Ceausescu. He was at school with his more famous cousin, Nikolai. He was a boy Nu se nu făcea nici o legătură cu niciun copil să știi. El lucra el sigur. Nu avea legătură cu nimeni. La școală învăța foarte bine. Făcea nici bine, nici rău, că nu avea cine să-i educa. Om ascuns, ca să spun așa, avea în sufletul lui ascuns. Unable to vent their rage on Ceausescu himself at the time of his death, a scornicest mob marched on the cemetery desecrating the tomb of his father, Andruza. This patriarch, father of 13 children, Nikolai was the third, was now revealed to have been the village drunk, his wife the saintly victim of his violent outbursts. He called two of his sons Nikolai because at the time of their birth he had been too intoxicated to think of another name. 
It was partly to escape a drunken father that young Nikolai Ceausescu, aged 12, left his village for Bucharest in 1930. Bucharest of the 1930s was one of Europe's most cosmopolitan capitals, the Paris of the Balkans. But young Ceausescu had neither the background, nor the education, nor the financial means to enjoy any of its delights. This spectacle was to fuel nothing but alienation, resentment and rage. Romania's politics were held in low esteem by everyone. King Carol was unpopular, extravagant and highly eccentric. The king first encouraged, then attempted to repress the fascist Iron Guards who briefly fascinated young Ceausescu. He lived with a sister, Nicolina, and became a cobbler's apprentice, though he was lazy and never learned to make shoes. From fellow apprentices, he acquired a crude fervor for socialism. Asked by his employer how on earth he expected to make a living if he didn't learn a trade, Nikolai Ceausescu said, I'll become Romania's Stalin. Scuola in care învățase cu atâta sârguință în sat continuă. Voința de instruire se învină acum cu sete arzătoare de dreptate socială. Tânărul muncitor stăruia îndelungă asupra filelor incandescente ale cărților luptei de clasă, ale teoriei socialismului științific, ale filozofiei comuniste. I found further evidence of the myth in the now closed museum of the Romanian Communist Party. Ion Ardelianu, its director, had been one of the myth makers. He had kept a secret file on the real Ceausescu and had a document which showed that Ceausescu's first brush with the police at the age of 15 had been for street fighting and not, as later alleged, a political confrontation. A year would pass before Vasile Dumitrescu recruited him into the tiny underground communist party. In 1936, aged 18, young Nikolai was arrested after distributing communist pamphlets and taken to Brasov, Transylvania, for a mass trial before a military court. Ceausescu craved to be the center of attention. His behavior at the Brasov trial was an early hint that this small-time agitator possessed an iron will to claw his way to the top. George Matescu, a journalist who covered the trial, expected him to be acquitted. Ceausescu era atât de neastâmbrat, atât de obraznic, încât a creat o atmosferă de nemulțumire, dar a influențat tribunalul militar și prin aceea că sentința a fost destul de aspră, nu le interesa niciodată, în chiar în un proces, decât atitudinea lui, situația lui. Sentenced to three years in Doftana jail. The mythmakers would later turn this prison into a place of pilgrimage for Ceausescu, and a visit there would become a compulsory part of the Romanian school curriculum. The myth was that in jail, Ceausescu's leadership qualities turned him into a legendary figure. In fact, he was a mere protege of senior communists who undertook his education. He acquired a smattering of Marxist-Leninist dogma from old books still on the prison library shelves today. He memorized texts his fellow prisoners said he did not fully understand. 
Here, he met the leaders of the Communist Party for the first time. One of them was the trade unionist George Apostol. On his release in 1939, he became a communist youth leader. The party was now his real family. At a social gathering of young communists, he met Elena Petrescu. She would play an increasingly important role in his life and eventually become part of the same myth. Later, propagandists superimposed both their pictures on this photograph of a communist organized May Day parade they never actually attended. In September 1939, Hitler invaded Poland and the Second World War began. Romanian oil was vital to Germany's war effort. Romania's dictator, Marshal Antonescu, became Hitler's ally. Ceausescu, described on the police list as a shoemaker, was one of Romania's 800 known communists to be arrested. So was Pavel Campianu. They would share the same cell for two years. Uh, Ceausescu had many small uh, but relevant manifestations of hysteria. Uh, he very fast used to lose control. When, uh, when uh, he disagreed with somebody, his way of disagreeing was uh, at the verge of, of uh, an explosion. Uh, he was violent in his way of speaking, uh, totally undelicate. Even he was trembling when, when uh, he was contradicted. But he had uh, natural uh, intelligence. He was very courageous. He was very devoted to the cause. In 1943, Ceausescu was transferred to Tirgu Giu prison. There, he met Gheorghe Gorgiu Dej, the highest ranking Romanian communist in captivity. Ceausescu made himself indispensable to him in all sorts of ways. A fellow inmate, Eugene Rusu, witnessed it all. Că el era apropiat de Gheorghiu, de Gheorghiu Deș, sau a militanților de rând. Gheorghiu avea camera lui, avea garsoniera lui și avea un băiat care îl servea. Acest băiat de procopsială era Nicolae Ceaușescu. Advancing Russian troops entered Bucharest after an anti-German coup staged by King Michael, Carol's son, on August 23rd, 1944. Watching the Russian army's victory parade in Bucharest, Ceausescu, now free, must have known his whole life was about to change. For even before Yalta, Churchill and Roosevelt had agreed to Romania becoming a Soviet-dominated puppet state while insisting on free elections. Ceausescu was on the road to real power at last. He ran for office in the 1946 elections, which the communists, thanks to stuffed ballot boxes, won by a landslide. Minutes after this appearance in the town of Slatina, an event occurred that should have put an immediate end to his political ambitions. A local bank manager had refused to contribute to Communist Party funds. On election day, in a fit of rage, Ceausescu murdered him on the steps of the town hall. The cover-up lasted until after Ceausescu's own death. The crime has never been revealed before. Dej, now Romania's leader, was aware of this murder, but impressed by Ceausescu's hard work and dedication, he made him, at 30, an instant major general. His colleagues all said he was rough with subordinates, but cringing to superiors. 
Ceausescu now lived the life of the privileged communist elite. He'd married Elena in 46, quickly fathering three children, Valentin, Zoya and Niku. Colleagues noted Elena invariably ruled the roost at home, was invaluable to him as he rose up the party ranks and helped him control his stammer. In the early 60s, Dej started moving Romania out of the Russian orbit, becoming popular in the country for the first time. But in 1965, Dej learned he was dying of cancer. Ceausescu felt such an opportunity should not be missed. The infighting that took place inside the palaces of top Romanian Communist Party leaders was usually a closely guarded secret. But two leading contenders told me how, as George Udej lay dying behind these walls, Nicolae Ceausescu outmaneuvered them, even though he was not the front runner to succeed him. In this secluded lakeside mansion, in the final weeks of his life, Dej made a dramatic decision which might well have changed the course of Romanian history. He decided to ditch the overeager Ceausescu. George Apostol, the chief contender, claimed that in the last few weeks of Dej's life, he became the heir apparent. Înainte cu trei luni de a muri, știind că este bun lav, să se convoace o plenară a Comitetului Central al Partidului Comunist Român și să preiau eu această funcție în conducerea partidului. Însă această plenară nu a mai putut avea loc Ordinary Romanians only learned of Dej's illness the day before he died. As the preparations for the funeral were made, Apostol could not know that Ceausescu had prepared a master plan to grab the leadership himself. Inside the Central Committee building, he got a key group of party elders to back him, promising they would remain the real power behind the scenes. They mistakenly believed they could handle the inexperienced Ceausescu. 25 years later, Maura, Ceausescu's chief ally, was still trying to justify himself. Că Ceausescu, fiind tânăr, fiind muncitor, nu numai ca origine socială, pentru că era copil de țăran, dar și ca persoană, un om care îi place să muncească. Dacă aș fi știut care sunt consecințele aducerii lui Ceaușescu, aș fi fost pentru înlăturarea lui. Adio, scump tovarăș și prieteni. Vom păstra în inimile noastre nestinsă amintirea vieții tale luminoase. The loyal servant had stepped into his master's shoes. Shortly afterwards, he destroyed Dej's reputation, turning him into a non-person. He would steal Dej's liberal policies to become popular and claim them as his own. A master stroke three years later was a visit to Prague in August 1968. Alexander Dubček, the reform-minded Czech leader, was trying to introduce communism with a human face. The West believed Ceausescu was equally keen on reform, and Ceausescu did his best to sustain this belief. Only five days after his visit, the Soviets and its allies invaded Czechoslovakia. Romania was the only Warsaw Pact country that refused to join in the operation. Ceausescu now played his trump card. In Bucharest, even anti-communist Romanians talked to me in glowing terms about Ceausescu that month. Overnight, 
As far as Western leaders were concerned, he became the man to watch. Richard Nixon was one of those responsible for creating the myth of Ceausescu, the anti-Russian communist, who should be rewarded for his independent stand. But few realized Moscow's reaction never went beyond mild exasperation. Mr. President, just a year ago, you welcomed me to Bucharest as the first American president ever to visit Romania. Today, I'm very honored to welcome you to Washington, D.C. as the first president of Romania ever to visit the United States of America. In Disneyland, Nikolai Ceausescu should have realized that his new image had an improbable Mickey Mouse quality. But Ceausescu had started believing in his own myth. His budding megalomania was the start of Romania's enduring nightmare. The turning point came in 1971 with his trip to China. He reveled in the welcome. Unaware of the appalling consequences of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, he saw only what he was meant to see, a disciplined people dedicated to the worship of the now senile Mao Zedong. He felt China's Cultural Revolution was a model for Romania to follow. By now, Elena Ceausescu was eager to play a more important role at her husband's side. Chiang Ching, Mao's wife, lost no time convincing Elena she should become more of a power in her own right. From China, the Ceausescu's flew to North Korea. The personality cult of its leader, Kim Il-sung, was on an even more grandiose scale. The Ceausescu's were suitably impressed. Three years later, in 1974, showing signs of growing egomania, Ceausescu made himself president. He told one of his ministers, a man like me comes along only once every 500 years. Despite his rift with Moscow, he remained a Stalinist in economic matters. On paper, Romanian economic growth was staggering, and he had no trouble raising money from Western banks. But that Romania's social and medical problems were totally neglected, and that most of the prestige investments he ordered were costly, uneconomic, and environmentally catastrophic, was conveniently overlooked. Elena took the advice of Chiang Ching, Mao's wife, seriously. Her lightning promotion within the Communist Party went hand in hand with a new identity. I'm redat sub conducere directă a tovarășii academician, doctor inginer Elena Ceaușescu, președintele Consiliului Național al Științei și Învățământului, savant de reputație internațională, ofirească încrederea omului de știință român în marile posibilități creatoare ale națiunii noastre. In Petrescht, her native village, they knew all about Elena. Her father had run a rural goods store in this tiny house. But they were far too frightened to set the record straight. Her school reports remained hidden under floorboards for several decades. When the local mayor finally dug them out, they revealed she had flunked everything but singing, sewing and gymnastics in her fourth year and had dropped out altogether at the age of 14. She was a repetenta, meaning someone too mediocre to move up to the next class. Repetente. Instead, in the 30s, she moved to Bucharest. Her first job was as an unskilled worker in a hole-in-the-wall patent medicine factory. Over 30 years later, becoming head of the Institute for Chemical Research, despite a total lack of real academic credentials, was the best revenge. Fie că este vorba de lucrări tehnologice, fie că este vorba de lucrări științifice, totul trebuie să apară cu numele Elenei Ceaușescu ca autor principal, semnate în forma 
în care le-am elaborat. Faptul că n-ar fi știut să pronunțe corect formula apei sau a bioxidului de carbon. For years, foreign scientists were fooled by an elaborate masquerade. I was told that Mrs. Ceausescu liked, I shouldn't even say Mrs. Ceausescu, that Comrade Ceausescu liked very much to consult everybody in her team about the answers, that the answers were supposed to be collective, not individual. So whenever somebody in our meetings, a foreign delegate, would ask a question, I was supposed to first wait for Mrs. Ceausescu to say the answer, and then somebody else, in her entourage would say a different answer. Mrs. Chaushes would sometimes repeat what that person said. Then I was allowed to translate. But actually, it was translating from the other person, not from Mrs. Chaushes directly. She had some papers in front of her. She sometimes consulted the papers. But her answer, I was told, I was never allowed to translate. <laughs> The personality cult pageantry staged for the Ceausescu's had begun with somewhat amateurish parodies of the Chinese and North Korean models. But party choreographers with limitless resources orchestrated these extravaganzas, giving them an almost religious flavor, identifying Romania with one godlike personality. artists outdid each other in commemorating the virtues of the perpetually youthful looking couple and their mutual love affair with the Romanian people. School children were taught to worship the Danube of Thought, the treasure of wisdom and charisma. Ceausescu became a national hero on a par with medieval kings and past Romanian nation builders like Vlad the Impaler. His collected works of stupefying dullness and actually ghosted by others were in every home and schoolroom. I have to tell that not even today, I'm not able to explain how so many intellectuals, how many good journalists, professionally speaking, they fought each other in exhausting the Romanian dictionary in finding the most impressive uh, characterization or the most impressive words trying to please Ceausescu and in this way to take advantage material, financial, uh, prestige, freedom sometime, freedom to, to travel abroad. So they sold themselves. At every level of society, there was this servile homage. It was all part of Romania's instinctive deference to authority, a traditional feature of its past. Ceausescu's televised appearances were invariably enhanced by careful editing. This was supervised by a special protocol unit, and this film editor's sole task for over 20 years was to remove all his flaws. Da, fiind vorba despre Ceausescu și fiind vorba despre uh, bâlbe și consoane repetate și uh, grimase ale feții, erau foarte dese și deci munca era enormă. Pentru a nu fi alături de Ceaușescu, nimeni mai înalt. Aveam totdeauna grijă ca toți operatorii care îl filmau să nu fie bărbați înalți. Nu suporta nicio prezență feminină alături de ea. De câte ori se montau filme în care apărea și ea, totdeauna trebuiau, uh, cadrul în care apărea ea trebuia să fie flancat de cadre în care apăreau bărbați. 
the presidential couple's craving for world recognition was all part of their growing need for adulation. With no lack of invitations from all over the world, they'd stick pins in this globe at random to determine where to go next. Un om politic către care omenirea privește cu încredere și respect fundă prețuire în vizite la invitația oamenilor politici ai lumii contemporane sau la dezbateri implicând destinul actual al planetei noastre, omul al cărui nume este rostit pretutindeni cu admirație și stimă, omul ce întruchipează prin exemplara lui viață și activitate, prin spiritul lui constructiv, vizionar, în altele mesaje de înțelegere între popoare, în numele idealurilor de libertate, progres și civilizație ale păcii și socialismului. This crass form of image building was designed to show Romanians that world leaders of every conceivable political variety looked on Ceausescu with veneration. But sometimes the Ceausescu's made an indelible impression for other reasons. Quand il est venu en visite officielle, c'est-à-dire en 1978, when he came on a state visit in 1978, he had completely changed. Power had gone to his head. He interrupted continuously. He was arrogant. He wouldn't let people speak. He laid down the law without allowing the slightest contradiction when his extremely narrow-minded views were questioned. He was our guest at the Hotel Marigny, where VIPs on official visits are housed opposite the Elysee Palace. Unfortunately, after he had left, the head of the Marigny residence came to see me appalled and said, it's frightful. The place has been wrecked. I didn't connect what he was saying with the recent visitors. But he said, they've taken everything away. There were lots of ornamental objects, lamps, vases, ashtrays, bathroom fittings. After their departure, the place had been emptied. Everything had been unscrewed and packed away. It was as if burglars had moved in for a whole summer. Naturally, this confirms the bad impression he and his team had made. And unofficially, of course, I warned those who were about to receive him, for he was on a European tour, that they should take the kind of precautionary measures I had been unable to foresee. Queen Elizabeth was compelled by the Callaghan government to welcome the Ceausescu's, complete with their food taster, at Buckingham Palace. A lucrative British aerospace contract was in the offing, and Ceausescu would only sign it if invited by the Queen and given a royal welcome. Sergiu Celak was the Ceausescu's interpreter. I think that the state visit to Britain was a sort of crowning ceremony, formal recognition of his and her imperial status. He had a healthy respect of royalty as a symbol of something he wanted for himself. He wanted, I think, to be a royal president in, of a communist country. The Ceausescu's also used the visit and his honorary knighthood to show his people the high esteem in which he was held abroad. Thanks to President Giscard's warning, nothing was stolen from Buckingham Palace, but the Ceausescu's were convinced their rooms were bugged. Years later, the aerospace deal would still be the subject of acrimonious debate. Ceausescu bought only one British plane and tried to pay for it with strawberries. Other hosts turned out to be even more gullible. The people of the United States are honored by having as our guest, a great leader of a great country. Their influence as Romanian leaders throughout the international world is exceptional. Our goals are also the same. To have a just system, we believe in enhancing human rights. The Ceausescu's were so pleasantly surprised by Carter's remarks they called in their interpreter that night and had him repeat them over and over again. A whole array of distinguished Americans were eager to meet the maverick good communists. I've enjoyed 
being with him. He's a very good advisor. He's a man who in the past has suffered greatly, uh, imprisoned, tortured, but because of his courage and because of his belief in the future of his own country, uh, notable achievements have been brought to the people who have confidence in him. But sometimes protocol was powerless to prevent the unexpected. In New York, he arrived at the end of his trip and he couldn't returned to the hotel late at night because a group of Hungarians had arrived and demonstrated and didn't allow him into the hotel. The next morning, the mayor and the, and the head of the city police were to come and apologize to him. And Ed Koch was then mayor. And Koch came in and said, Mr. President, last night those friends of mine were down there demonstrating against you, and they tell me you don't give freedom of religion and freedom of and cultural freedoms to your Hungarians living in Transylvania. Is that true, Mr. President? And Ceausescu uh, was, went white. And he turned to me and he said, what does the State Department say about this? How does he talk to me like this? And I said, well, the federal government has its policies and the mayor has it. But it was, uh, and he got furious. And he said he was going to leave. And he didn't leave early because uh, Mrs. Ceausescu had not yet been to Cartier and she spent three and a half hours in Cartier uh, that day. Heroes of the games, Romania. And again, a standing ovation, defying the Eastern European boycott. In the West, well into the 80s, Ceausescu's anti-Russian stance was paying off. One diplomat who was not taken in was David von der Berg. I was reading about and witnessing the destruction of churches and synagogues on a regular basis, the murder of pastors and priests, the jailing and persecution of political and religious dissidents, and basically a horrible reign of terror that Ceausescu was carrying out. I reported this information back to Washington on a weekly basis, and it didn't affect policy in terms of Washington continuing to consider Ceausescu as a favorite son. It helped keep Ceausescu in power for many more years without exposing him for what he really was. Few Western leaders were aware of Ceausescu's growing paranoia. Ceausescu's plan was to be able to monitor the whole population. That's the way he kept his grip on power. There was a big army of very little people, faceless people who didn't know anything, didn't do anything but listening and writing what was happening in the most intimate moments of the life of everybody. General Pacepa, still in hiding today, was Ceausescu's top intelligence aide until he crossed over to the West in 1978. On Ceausescu's orders, all traces of his past existence were removed. It was this defection that fueled Ceausescu's growing paranoia. An obsessive concern for secrecy and personal security led him to extend an already existing network of underground tunnels and bunkers in Bucharest. Increasingly, he began operating through Securitate, the secret police. On his instructions, Securitate deliberately acquired a fearful reputation for psychological as opposed to physical terror. Romanians believed that in any workplace, at any social gathering, half the people present were spying on the other half for Securitate. It was a kind of a psychological terror. Try to imagine a huge apparatus spreading rumors spreading the feeling of fear and terror, like creating a psychological atmosphere in which common people used to think that if they will try to do the smallest gesture, insignificant gesture, which can be identified as an opposition to the political regime in Romania, and especially to Ceausescu, they will disappear. Securitate also guarded the Ceausescu's collection of stately homes. All over Romania, the couple appropriated the finest residences 
retreating into their reclusive private world. The interiors were interchangeable in a kitsch French Renaissance style. This was one of 40 palaces. Huge ballrooms were decorated at enormous expense and used only once every 10 years. After visiting Versailles Palace, Elena developed a passion for chandeliers. The bathrooms reflected their increasing obsessions with health and status. Because Elena tended to put on weight, exercise machines and Romanian-designed jacuzzis were a feature of every palatial abode. Her other passion was for stained glass. Every night, wherever they happened to be, they watched a movie. He was a Kojak and Columbo fan. She liked romantic costume dramas. Both adored The Great Gatsby, which they saw over and over again, sometimes as often as once a week. The Gatsby lifestyle, filmed by Sicuritati for their home movies, became their dream come true. Their personal staff bore the brunt of Elena's petty stinginess, as their head waiter recalled. A fost o situație în care Nicolae Ceaușescu, în urma unei sărbători a ziua numelui, a luat tortul de pe masă, tortul aniversar, și mi l-a înmânat, mi l-a dat ca să-l împărțim personalului. Elena Ceaușescu s-a opus. Food tasters sampled all their meals because of their paranoid fear of poison. Minute portions of everything they ate were sent to laboratories and analyzed. The fiction of an exemplary family life was maintained. But Niku's scandalous playboy excesses were talked about in hushed whispers, as were Valentin's strained relations with his parents. With their daughter Zoya, they put on a public show of affection. But, as she told me, the family tensions were considerable. Au fost în mare măsură puși de mama mea să ne supravegheze pe noi toți copiii dintr-o, cred, grijă, dragoste, se poate spune oricum exagerat. Deci, normal că, ce de la securitate, putem să fac orice, nu putem să facă nimic. În schimb, cu părinții mei, dat fiind informațiile pe care le obțineau prin cei de la securitate, am avut destule neînțelegeri. As the excess of power continued to impair Ceaușescu's judgment, he came to believe he was above human frailties and didn't need medication. El de fapt făcuse un tratament incorrect al diabetului că nu acceptase niciun tratament. El era mai irritabil, el era un tip care nu mai credea în nimeni, el nu se mai lăsa influențat de nimeni. Singurul om cu care putea să mai vorbească era soția lui, Elena Ceaușescu. Ideea că puterea transformă până la urmă, în sfârșit, de fapt, nu ridică, ci părerea mea este coboară sau chiar poate să distrugă un om. Că muncea mult, că era activ. Este adevărat. Cred că nu mai avea discernământul, poate forța. A încercat să conduci singur o țară, chiar atât de mică cât e România asta, mi se pare deja o exagerare. Mi se pare deja... Cred că asta a fost greșeala esențială.
the most striking example of his megalomania was the way he pursued his one single-minded hobby. Every regional party secretary knew his career depended on the way he organized Ceausescu's shooting parties. Pe Nicolae Ceaușescu nu-l interesa, practic, în esența, esența vânătorii. Îl interesau trofeele care, cât cele mai mari. Nu, practic, nu îl interesa esența vânătorii, plăcerea de a vâna, doar mărimea trofeelor. În momentul când apărea, într-adevăr, un trofeu mare, era chemat și Nicolae Ceaușescu pentru a-l împușca. Ursul, practic, venea pentru mâncare, era împușcat. Ceaușescu would be informed, and when the poor animal blundered into view, expecting lunch, Ceaușescu would be there with his gun to claim the biggest trophy. His favorite rifle was a present from Queen Elizabeth. He even imported polar bears, but they died before he could kill them. A securitate cameraman was very nearly killed recording this massive boar hunt. To prove his marksmanship, Securitate faked this film, including the clumsily added gun flashes, showing him killing a wild boar with every shot. For George Maurer, who had helped him to power, Ceausescu's behavior was a sure sign of instability. Prima impresie de boală am căpătat-o de Ceaușescu văzându-l la vânătoare. Cum strângea vânatul de la toată lumea ca să-l pui în fața lui, să spui că l-am puscat el. Avea echipe. In the rows of slaughtered animals, was proof of his mastery over at least some of the elements around him. I can't help feeling that his increasing passion for killing was an escape from problems surfacing in the early 80s. The catastrophic state of hospitals and orphanages, the lack of food in the shops. In a further flight from reality, he was developing a new obsession. Ceausescu, the town planner, was now intent on turning once cosmopolitan Bucharest into a monstrous concrete city resembling North Korea's capital, Pyongyang. From 1984 onwards, one-fifth of old Bucharest simply disappeared along with 50,000 homes. The showpiece of renovated Bucharest was the House of the Republic. The avenue of the victory of socialism was deliberately designed to be broader and longer than the Champs-Élysées in Paris. The largest building in the world was intended as Ceausescu's posthumous legacy to an admiring nation. care sâmbătă Ceaușescu avea în program de a vizita șantierele Bucureștiului. Adică îl interesa absolut tot ce era șantier și ceea ce începuse să se construiască. Noi eram extrem de obosiți înainte de vizită pentru că pregăteam șantierul. Avea o forță vitală absolut excepțională. El era foarte atent la absolut toate detaliile. Nu se poate spune din primul moment că este vorba de o lipsă de decizie a lui Ceaușescu, ci de o schimbare a unor decizii pe care le dădea. De asta s-a inițiat o nebunie, aș putea spune, o nebunie a machetelor la scară naturală. Noi, ca arhitecți, am încercat să luăm aprobările pe machete mici, machete mai mari care the sheer scale of this completely useless architectural white elephant was enough to call the Ceausescu's sanity into question. But such was their grip on the country in the 80s that only a handful of dissident Romanians dared to speak up. 
In any case, environmental rape on an even larger scale was taking place in the countryside. To achieve a cultural revolution that had constantly eluded him and increased Securitatis' grip, Ceausescu started bulldozing 5,000 villages and moving the farmers into flats. His goal was to turn peasants into workers. By the late 80s, his image in the West had been reduced to that of an old-fashioned Stalinist out to wreck Romania's cultural heritage. From his spring palace in Bucharest, Ceausescu watched on television the Malta summit in November 89 between Bush and Gorbachev, convinced they were plotting his downfall. He couldn't grasp that now the Cold War was ending, his anti-Soviet posturing had become obsolete. He hadn't changed, the rest of the world had. By this time, Elena was practically running the country, screening Ceausescu's mail and censoring all disturbing reports addressed to him. Even Securitate stopped briefing him on the Romanian's real mood. The time would come when the wildest rumors would spread over the origins of the uprising that toppled Ceausescu. My own view is that while there were indeed some establishment figures ready to betray him when the time was ripe, it was the spontaneous behavior of ordinary Romanians that triggered their action. With disturbances in Transylvania already well underway, Ceausescu was unwise enough to hold a rally in Bucharest. So provocative was this that later it was believed some of his own advisors had set him up. For the first time, Romanians dared show their true feelings. Romanian television went dead and the revolution began. Nu a spus nimănui nimic. S-a văzut că este complex schimbat în fizionomia pe care o avea de obicei și a dat seama de marile pericol ce l-așteaptă și am impresia că a intuit sfârșitul său. With an angry rooftop mob closing in on them, the Ceausescu's panic and made their escape by helicopter, ignoring the network of tunnels that might have saved their lives. After they had left Bucharest, Romanians went on an anti-Ceausescu rampage as the army joined the revolution. Aware of the turning tide, their helicopter pilot ditched them by the roadside. Hours later, they'd been arrested and were prisoners in an army barracks still unable to believe their luck had run out at last. Dotted around Romania were dozens of palaces they had never even bothered to visit. Now, their last three nights were spent huddled together, bickering on a camp bed in this tiny room. Major Tecu was one of the officers guarding them round the clock. Vrei să lupti alături de mine? Saper cauza? I-am răspuns lui Nicolae Ceaușescu, zic că... Care cauză? Pentru că eu sunt de partea poporului acum. Dau un cont în bancă, uite acum, vreo 2-3 milioane de dolari, nu ți-ar fi bun? A început să mă mituiască. Nu mă așteptam ca din ceea ce știam despre el, conducătorul, marele geniu, să ajungă să mituiască un maior al armatei română. At the farcical trial, their mutual dependency was their one redeeming feature. They remained true to type. He was stubborn, full of inarticulate rage. She remained, almost to the very end, a foul-mouthed, hot-tempered autocrat who terrified all those who had served her. We'll never know what the Ceausescu's thought as they finally understood they were about to die. 
But my guess is that both remain so insulated from reality that despite this ultimate rejection of everything they stood for, they still believed that they and they alone were the victims of this tragedy. A fost momentul în care au fost luați către, pe lângă zid, deplasați în locul acesta, iar în momentul în care au ajuns la colțul clădirii, un soldat a zis, a încurcat la care ea a zis, fie armăta dracu. Mergând mai departe către zid, vedeți, distanța este foarte mică, ea a zis, Nicule, nu credeam că se mai omoară în România. Asta a fost cam printre ultimele cuvinte pe care le-a scos ea. Iar el, ceea ce scută, erau niște... Nu mai trage nimeni! Ridică-l să-l vedem. Ridică-l să-l vedem. Ridică-l. Mai sus capul. The soldiers had been told to aim at the body, not the face, so people would recognize him and know he was really dead. Hidden away in a cluttered Bucharest warehouse is all that's left of the Ceausescu's in their glory. Gifts and mementos of their world travels, tokens of an era all those who helped foster the myth would rather forget.